Hi, I'm James Schellinglaw, and I'm here with a f familiar face, if you've been watching us, uh, Roger Block, who's president of Travel Leaders Network. Now, Travel Leaders Network just held uh, their very first virtual Bridge to the Future conference, which obviously has replaced uh, some of the live conferences that should have taken place this year. And we wanted to get uh, sort of Roger's take on how that went, as well as uh, a status report on Travel Leaders Network, and also look at some of the programs uh, that were introduced uh, during this Bridge to the Future. Now, you're going to find out about all that and more on Insider Travel Report. Now, Roger, first of all, how are you and where are you? Actually, I'm great, James. I'm actually home in Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, uh, hunkered down, but... Uh, I have traveled some, which is uh, great. Went to Disney World. Good for you. I want to go there. <laughs> I took uh, my kids and my grandkids uh, for a long weekend. That uh, I, you know, it's always a magical. And uh, you know, we uh, also went down to Universal uh, for some some work since we're holding our Edge Conference next year at uh, Universal Studios in Florida. So we went down and visited them. And uh, did, they did some work for us in filming uh, our uh, uh, Bridge to the Future conference. So. Oh, great. Well, so we can look forward to that. I know that's where the conference was supposed to be uh, this year. So yes. uh, it, it, let's, let's try to do take two uh, for next uh, spring, right? It's in Correct. Uh, next May. Next, next May. May. Okay. Next, that's uh, May. Okay. Well, I, I, I had planned to be at the one uh, this past uh, uh, spring and, and now I hopefully will be uh, there uh, again when you, when you, I'm looking forward to it, but yeah, uh, I am too. Let's talk about it, uh, about Bridge to the Future. Uh, first of all, roughly how many travel advisors and suppliers attended, uh, and, and would you consider it to be a success and why? Well, first of all, uh, thank you again for uh, having me. Bridge to the Future for us was a huge success. Uh, uh, knock on wood, the technology worked uh, uh, most of the time, a few minor glitches. Uh, so that was a, a major concern of ours, obviously. Uh, attendance was uh, about 50% uh, uh, larger than we've ever had at one of our national conferences. We had over 3,000 advisors in attendance. Uh, we had over 100 of our preferred suppliers in attendance. Um, but some of the, the great stats were, uh, it, it wasn't just uh, they attended, for example, with our supplier showcase, uh, we had almost 47,000 uh, booth visits. Mm. Uh, so when you think about the number of attendees uh, going to see uh, uh, the various suppliers, that's a, that's a huge uh, number. We also had uh, people attending uh, uh, all of our general sessions, uh, obviously all of our, uh, our, uh, our workshops uh, in, in total. For example, we had three general sessions and uh, we had over 11,000 attendees at the general sessions. Uh, workshops, we had 118,000 views. And the interesting thing is that even though the, the session is over, uh, we have posted uh, all the sessions on our intranet called Agent Universe, mm -hmm. and we are still getting thousands of views on that. Mm -hmm. So it, it, is it like a, an in-person event? No. Uh, there's not the networking that happens. There's not the... Uh, going up and hugging of old friends and that type of thing. Uh, even though we did have uh, ways, uh, we had a networking lounge where they could uh, meet and, <clears throat> and get together. It's not the same. Right. And we all know it's not the same. Yeah. So while it was a success in getting the content, it was a success in getting uh, the views. Uh, it was, uh, it's just not the same as in person. No, absolutely. And I'll, I'll be honest with you. I, I, I have gone back to your general sessions and some of your sessions to watch them after the fact. Uh, so it's kind of like watching reruns, you know, like I'm, <laughs> I, I'm watching old Hogan's Heroes or something, you know, so it's a little, they're a little different, but it's actually good because I, and I hope you'll, I, and actually that leads to my next question. Uh, is this something that you plan to do in the future in addition to your live conferences? Because obviously not everybody can get to uh, Orlando, we'll be able to get to Orlando and, and you have a capacity limits too. Yeah. Uh, and, and it is something we are planning on doing. Uh, the question is what and, and in what format. Uh, the software we used for Bridge 
uh, is a, a lot more expensive than a Zoom meeting because it has a general session area, it has workshop areas, it has uh, different networking or uh, trade show. But when you think of the number of meetings that we do have, when you think of the geographical distribution of our membership, literally in every state in the United States and in every province in Canada, uh, there is no way for everyone to get to everything. Yeah. Uh, so we are looking at what can we do, uh, what can we videotape, uh, what's the cost, how do we uh, mix live versus video. For example, I, I did a workshop uh, that really discussed about uh, uh, managing your business in, in uh, these times and uh, protection of cash flow and right. uh, trying to do projections for cash flow for the future, uh, which is critical for, I think, everyone's survival. No one knows if there's going to be another PPP program or, or similar type thing. But uh, uh, it's something that everyone needs to, to project as to what type of cash they're going to be uh, uh, having over the next uh, nine to 12 months, which to me is the most critical time. Uh, and and I, I presented an easy way to try to calculate that because most people aren't accountants. Uh, they're, they're great travel advisors, but accounting and skills for some are, are, are harder than for others. So, but I taped the, the uh, session, but then we had live Q and A Right. And that worked extremely well, uh, even though it wasn't uh, verbal questions. The questions uh, were typed in and, and I could discuss it. And then if they needed clarification, they type in, can you expound on this or that or the other? So, yeah, we're definitely looking at uh, how we can do that for regional type meetings and uh, 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 especially trade shows and, and that type of thing. And uh, I believe it will become part of our portfolio of how we try to communicate going forward. Yeah, now it really is. I guess the one, with the one, if there is one good thing that came out of this, it's Zoom and these uh, virtual things. Although I have to say that they, when they get piled up on top of each other, it's hard for me to keep track because I, I actually go to a lot of these, as you know. So oh, I, it, it, <laughs> I feel for you. And, and uh, you know, that's why I, need, I always say, is this recorded? And uh, usually if it's recorded, I, I still have to catch up with a few things uh, that I have to get. In fact, when I go back, I think you guys are still, I can get on. I'm going to look at a couple other sessions. Yeah, we're, we're keeping ours up for uh, several weeks. So that's it's, great. Uh, that's great. Now, uh, now let's let's talk about the state of Travel Leaders Network today. Uh, roughly, how many travel agencies do you have, and how many travel advisors uh, today? You know, we, uh, in terms of a uh, number of locations, we're still over five thousand. Mm -hmm. uh, we've seen some consolidation, uh, not near as much as we initially predicted. Uh, I think a lot of that has to do with preparation of the agencies uh, acting very quickly on cutting their costs, uh, looking at every expense they have. But ov obviously the PPP program uh, in the United States and a similar type program in Canada was a godsend uh, for, for most of these agencies. We've had a number of agencies, meaning less than 20, but a number of agencies who have close their brick and mortar for a certain period of time. Right. Most are saying they're going to reopen uh, at some point in the future. Uh, whether they do or not, uh, I was talking to one corporate agency who is planning on uh, uh, staying a virtual basically forever. They will take a very small uh, administrative office for their accounting team. Uh, but people, this is going to change uh, the way some people do business for a long, long time. The other interesting thing is that we continue to grow. Uh, uh, as of uh, uh, the end of last month, we had added over 150 new members in the United States and uh, 17 in Canada. So that's not as much uh, or as many as we uh, added in, uh, in 2019, but it's probably 90% of what we've added. Uh, so we're very pleased that uh, uh, agencies are still looking for uh, a new home that uh, uh, will provide the types of services and programs that will help them increase their sales and grow their profitability. So we're very pleased with that. Uh, obviously, if the PPP money had not come through, uh, I think the number of agencies who had permanently closed uh, would have been much, much higher. 
But uh, as I said, uh, that did. And uh, uh, we would sincerely like another round of PPP. We're working very hard yeah. with ASTA and uh, others to lobby uh, all of the congressmen uh, for a program. Obviously, politics isn't getting in the way, uh, but it is what it is. So, but hopefully, uh, post-election, uh, uh, the government will come around and, and do another round. And I think that will really help our agencies through the next uh, six to nine months. Well, that's, I, I think they're going to need that. And, and obviously we'd hoped that things would be settled before the election. And now, as you said, it looks probably till after the election, uh, especially when you get alarming statistics that like ASTA released that 73% of ASTA's members might be out of business in six months. And that, I think when they said that, that was, uh, uh, it's now five months. Uh, so, uh, we hope that something can get through. Of course, you know, we could see some sales coming back and we all hope that this would happen, uh, right. a lot earlier that we would have sales for 2021. And, uh, but then they, you know, at this point, and we're going to talk about this, uh, agencies don't get the money for a long time, even if they do book those sales. So, uh, now, now let's talk, let's talk about, you did launch a number of new products and services to support your members. And let's talk about some of them. Uh, first, tell us a bit about, uh, your agency matchmaking maker and what it does. Um, and and uh, I, I believe this is a way that mem your members can uh, buy and sell um, their agencies. Uh, it's exactly right. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, not only the Travelers Network, but the entire industry in North America uh, has a high percentage of owners who got into the business in the late 70s and 80s, uh, who are now uh, very much approaching retirement age. So uh, it really had nothing to do with COVID, even mm -hmm. though that did accelerate it. Uh, but we, we did start a program last year and we have updated it and uh, uh, really put it on steroids. It's called Agency Matchmaker. And the whole theory is that if you are an agency owner, one, you want to keep it as confidential. But who do you sell to? Uh, obviously, you'd like to sell to someone who your business, whatever type it is, whether it's host, whether it's 100% leisure, 100% cruise, 100% corporate, a mixture, you want to find a buyer where your agents, your advisors, and your customers will be uh, a, a good home, uh, so to speak. And so what we've done is created this agency matchmaker, which allows you, the uh, seller, to go in and say, I'm looking for a agency that would like to buy me located in this geographical part of the world, if you care, uh, that specializes in these various things, that offers this type of GDS, if you have a GDS, uh, that uh, uh, whatever the parameters are, and there's about 15 to 20 different parameters, you can look at, and then uh, the search engine will uh, give you a list of all the agencies that are looking to buy other agencies mm -hmm. uh, like yours. Uh, you then reach out to the contact person, so it's 100% confidential, uh, which is the key. No one wants uh, uh, their advisors to know, oh, we're selling. Right. Uh, that creates uh, uh, all type of... Uh, of uh, concern by the advisors should they start looking for another job or whatever. Uh, you also don't want your customers to know that you're selling until after the fact. Sure. So this, this keeps it uh, where you are reaching out to potential buyers. You then talk to them. You And, and we travel leaders are not involved in the transaction at all. Mm -hmm. uh, we do hear about it afterwards. Uh, but uh, we do not, uh, we're not involved. We do not act as advisors uh, because in effect, uh, both parties are our customers. So we really can't advise one versus the other on the particulars of, of a particular transaction. We do uh, strongly advise that they use uh, uh, experienced legal counsel. Right. Um, because the, the complexity of selling an agency, even if it's uh, what you think is a simple agency, it's uh, how do you handle commissions, future commissions, sure. where, you, where you've uh, maybe you've got a sale, you got a deposit, you don't have final payment. Who gets the commission? If you've gotten final payment, but the commission's not paid, you, there's still work to be done. How do you handle all that? 
And so it's uh, by using experienced legal counsel, uh, it just helps you both sides walk through those uh, parameters. Because the worst thing is if you don't address it in, in the document and, and then you try to argue over it after the fact, that's a major problem. So yeah, we, we inter- introduced that. We also introduced a program uh, called the Trusted Travel Advisor Program, uh, which is an, an educational program uh, for professional development. It was introduced in 2019, but we really amped it up. Uh, it's a clear path for uh, personal professional enrichment for all advisors, no matter what skill level, no matter if they're corporate or leisure. Uh, we, you know, the advisor's role is becoming so critical for the, you know, the types of travel that uh, our customers are, are looking at. It's, uh, um, and, and their job is so complex. Uh, very few advisors sell only one product or one right. destination. So they really have to, if they're not an expert on a particular destination, at least they need to know where to find the information uh, so that they can service the client uh, with the type of expertise and skill they need to. Do you know, also, do you know how many people have taken that course so far? Since uh, you- I, I don't have that number, James, but I could get it to you uh, later. Uh, but uh, we have, it, it's, it's, we're, we're seeing great acceptance. The advisors know that they need to continue uh, their education to be able to provide their customers, their clients with the level of service they need. Mm-hmm. But another one we, we introduced, uh, which to us really is out of COVID, and that's the Book with Confidence Pledge. And, and right. what this really is, uh, customers are concerned about their safety. Uh, traveling in today's COVID world. And there are so many different changing policies. I heard today where Ireland has just uh, implemented a, uh, a new lockdown. So they're changing every day. Uh, there's new protocol, there's new testing, there's new everything. So what the Book with Confidence Pledge is, it's not a guarantee, but it's a uh, educational program whereby uh, you, the advisor, go through uh, the program, and it really teaches you where to look for all of the latest uh, rules, regulations, requirements uh, for particular destinations, uh, what are the uh, COVID protocols around the globe, uh, and, and how the advisors should talk about COVID in, in the consultative sales process. Um, we have a, a, a badge that uh, uh, once they go through the course, they can put on all of their uh, uh, marketing materials, but it's a way to help the client know that our advisors are, are, are qualified and uh, really are looking at the various uh, uh, different rules on, on how, what COVID is in every particular destination. Well, I know it's amazing. It's, it's you know it's really a maze out there, and you know it's. I know that even before you you branded it with a book with confidence, and now that you have this program, but you know when you looked at Agent Universe, your internet, uh, you had a lot of that information about uh, keeping your members up to date on supplier policies and before destination requirements, yes. uh, other information related uh, to the pandemic. But now you have this uh, uh, book with confidence program where. At least, you know, when you're client facing, the client can say, okay, this is someone who knows uh, what's up. Right. And, and you mentioned uh, uh, our internet, and, and we have a team that constantly is taking all the information from all the suppliers. Uh, we have another team that is working with the airlines uh, and, and various destination requirements uh, for travel. And we, we, we are literally updating that on a daily basis. So uh, our members really don't have to search in a uh, hundred different places to try to find it. Uh, we have uh, links there basically to everywhere, all airlines, hotels, cruise lines, tour operators, and almost every country in the world. No. And it's not just every country, as we know in the United States, New York has one policy. Uh, Florida has a totally different policy. So, uh, uh, yeah, I, I have, I've run into that. New York has a lot of policies. Put it that yes, way. they do. 
Yeah, uh, I actually wrote, I wrote I wrote a story about that uh, about two three weeks ago, and finally Astor picked up on it and wrote a letter to the governor saying, you know, you want to kill travel, you're about ready to. So uh, uh, it's it's sad because you know uh, New York uh, had quarantines on about thirty plus states off and on, and that was okay, but, you know, and it, I, I dealt with that. But then they put quarantines on almost everybody coming from a foreign country. And uh, well, that, that well, New York, as of yesterday, was up to forty-six states. Forty-six states, boy. Forty-six we, states. Forty-six states. So really, uh, New Yorkers can't. The big, the biggest problem is New Yorkers can't travel and uh, out out of state, and then people can't come to visit New York. So, uh, oh, I but I've heard people are doing things like uh, they're flying to Newark and then taking a, a car back to the city. Or uh, I had some friends who live in Buffalo and they flew into Erie, Pennsylvania. And then drove across. So, uh, well, you never know. Maybe New York should just build a wall. We'll see. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I want to talk about some other programs you have. Uh, yeah. Uh, you, you, yeah, we, we're going to go back and talk a little bit. You also have a new thing called uh, uh, that, that basically helps uh, uh, independent contractors uh, find uh, uh, the right host agency. And I, I, I'm not sure. I thought this had already been around, but you t- said TLN hosts. Right. Uh, uh, it, tell, tell us a little bit about that one. Yeah, again, it, it had been around, but uh, again, all of our programs, uh, we continue to try to uh, make them more robust and, and uh, useful. Uh, TR and hosts is, as we know, there's there's an awful lot of, uh, of uh, independent contractors. Our network, uh, uh, we have almost 50,000 advisors, about half ICs, half uh, employees, uh, but we have a number of very, very large hosts in our network. Uh, a no- number of the agencies that uh, uh, close in our network, uh, m- most of them actually are now becoming ICs uh, for someone else. Sure. Uh, they were small agencies to begin with. But the question is, which, type, which host provides the services that you really want? And uh, yes, you can go to some other sources, but there really is no source where you can can uh, look and see. I think we have over 50 hosts listed. Mm-hmm. What services they offer? Again, what GDSs do they offer? What are their fee structures? What do they specialize in? What is What do they do for marketing? What do they do for education? What do they do for problem resolution? Um, all of those type of questions. Uh, do you want uh, a host that's uh, near you physically so uh, you can have the opportunity to, to uh, say, visit with a supplier when the supplier is in town? Uh, maybe that doesn't matter to you. So we developed the TON host, uh, which is really open for all advisors throughout the United States. Uh, and then they can look at the uh, various uh, uh, descriptions of all the hosts that are within travel leaders and find one that really works for them. Mm. Uh, And uh, this is almost like a job search. If you were thinking about it, if, if you're looking to go to work for someone, you want to ask, what are my benefits? What, what will they do for me? Uh, How will they help me grow my business? How will they help me make more money? Uh, and that's really what TLN Host is all about. It's to help you, the independent contractor, find a host that will meet your needs uh, and uh, help you achieve your goals and objectives. No, that's um, a great that's a great program. And I know there are, as you said, there are other sources out there. But if you have something internal that is really referring to the hosts within your network. Uh, uh, it's a great deal. I know there are an awful lot of host agencies. I mean, almost every agency these days is some kind of host, but correct. Uh, uh, basic from your history, from Travel Leaders Network, uh, a lot of those hosts are members of, of your group. So Yeah, but, but the difference really is there are people who have, they're really a retail agency that have five or ten. Right. The, the real hosts have a whole team dedicated to supporting the independent contractor. Now, maybe that's not important to you. Maybe you, you're totally uh, fine with uh, without that strong support, but you're looking for other things. That's why TRM Host is there, is because there is no one perfect host agency for everything. 
No, absolutely. And I, having covered this for quite some time, host agencies and seen the development, uh, it's a great, great source now that you're developing there. I wanted to talk about another program uh, uh, you're calling <coughs> Insight. In, excuse oh, me. Oh. <laughs> Insider, by the way. <laughs> and, and I won't charge you a dime for it. It's okay. Um, and in, in your case, it's really developing fam trips for your advisors to get back on the road to explore destinations, particularly now in the Caribbean and Mexico, right? Correct. Yeah, it's, uh, again, as I mentioned uh, in the beginning, I, I took my uh, children, my grandchildren to Disney, and I have been there, um, I don't want to tell you how many times, <laughs> but it was extremely interesting to see how Disney is social distancing. Right. What is the requirements of masks? What is the wait times? How have they changed uh, uh, food service? Uh, all of the various things. And that's really what a client is looking to find out is, is, is that personal expertise. It's one thing to read it, great publication that you have, but it's another to experience it. So our team working with uh, several resorts, uh, including Palace and Iberostar and Sandals, have put together a number of, uh, of uh, fam trips uh, as you mentioned, uh, Mexico is our first because it is uh, really the first that opened up and we've been working on this for several weeks, but we just announced it. Uh, we, uh, the day we opened up the uh, uh, FAMS, we had over 500 people apply to go wow. for the 152 spots. Oh so we are now looking at uh, adding uh, uh, more uh, destinations, um, Obviously, as river cruises start and as Europe is opened up, uh, we'll be working with them. But we're, we're working uh, with uh, resorts in the DR. We're working with uh, uh, resorts actually in Florida. And it's where people can travel to today. Uh, but it is a, a huge success. Uh, we will continue to expand on it. Uh, but again, it all gets down to... Uh, allowing the advisors to personally experience what is happening uh, with the various resorts. So we know many of the resorts, uh, breakfast and lunch show was basically a buffet. How are they handling that? Uh, you know, what changes have they made? Uh, um, and I think uh, from the people who have returned, uh, the experiences have been uh, extremely good. They were, uh, I've talked to several of them, and uh, uh, they were very impressed with the precautions that the resorts have taken. Um, and, and that just gives them confidence to talk to their clients that saying, if you go here, I was just there. Yeah. I went to look at these other resorts. This is what they're doing. And it's that level of confidence. I think uh, an awful lot of uh, travelers are looking for, they want someone who's been there, who has seen it, who has experienced it, and who can report accurately. Well, I was, I was actually on another uh, travel advisor fam uh, just a few, about a few weeks ago. And um, some of those advisors, they loved it. They, they enjoyed seeing everything and getting to know it. And some were selling right there uh, to their clients uh, that, you know, they obviously get on their iPhones or their tablets and they, they were, they're saying, hi, I'm here. Uh, it's, it's, it's good. It's safe. Uh, and they made a booking. So uh, uh, actually that's exactly what we're hearing. The amount of, uh, social media, these, uh, advisors are doing, uh, I, I was talking to one and within a week they had 20 bookings. Wow. So, that's great news. Now, now what, how do you choose uh, who's going to go? It, it's actually, uh, you know, they apply, uh, and uh, I'm not involved in it, uh, but we look at what they've uh, sold in the past and uh, have they been, in this case, have they sold uh, Mexico in the past and uh, uh, are they a producer? Because again, uh, Palace, Iberostar, Sandals, they're looking for a return on their investment. This isn't just a vacation, yeah. uh, even though it is. Um, but they, they want someone who can produce. And so that's what we're doing is matching up people who have done it. And then obviously we are bringing in some uh, new folk uh, to the industry that uh, want to go, but we're trying to focus on the ones who have, who have been uh, sellers of uh, that product in the past. 
Well, it's a great program. And I, once again, I will not charge you a royalty for the name inside. Okay. Uh, we, we sincerely you appreciate it. You have to invite it. me to go along. That's it. That's not <laughs> it. It's a little quick program. As long as you write a nice story. I will. I will. I'll talk to all your travel advisors. Perfect. That's what I do. <laughs> Um, now, I want to talk a little bit about in, in your keynote address, your virtual keynote address, uh, you, you t- emphasize the need for your members to really start charging fees. Uh, uh, you know, we talk about what type of fees, whether that's transactional service consulting. Um, it, it's, uh, you know, for me and you, we've both been around a bit and we've seen this issue come up and again and again. And I'm always surprised that more travel agencies and travel advisors don't charge fees. But here, here we have another opportunity to you know, tell them this is a way to get compensated up front and, and you really should take advantage of it. Uh, uh, what was, is, is this sort of the same thing we saw 20 years ago or ever since? Uh, or do you sense that there's more acceptance, acceptance this time about charging fees now because of this pandemic? Well, a couple points. One, uh, you mentioned 20 years ago. Uh, I think we need to move away from the mindset of a service fee, which uh, if you think about it, it, was primarily based on air commissions that went away. Mm-hmm. What travel advisors do today is dramatically different than what they did 20 years ago. Today, travel advisors are no longer just order processes of air, but they have such consultive sales roles, and they have to span the world of knowledge acquired by not only their own travels, but training, supplier product, etc., And so by taking the language of a professional compensation versus a service fee, I think this allows all of us to personalize the industry and attract top talent into our business. The the other reason or another reason is that I think this uh, pandemic has taught all of us that we can't just rely on a person who makes a booking that we will get paid eventually. Right number of cancellations, the number of rebookings. Yes, some suppliers uh, stepped up and and, uh, paid uh, for both bookings, but many, many didn't. And so uh, our advisors did all the work. Our advisors provided all this consultative servicing. And then when they had to cancel, they went through and did, you know, basically did a refund then had to rebook. So in effect, they're doing triple work. Right. Uh, and, and they weren't being compensated for that. Uh, every other professional industry charges for their consulting time. And there may be other sources of revenue. Uh, whether you're a financial advisor, you may earn commission. You're still charging the client up front. So it's really two things. One, you're really charging for your knowledge and your expertise. And then if you're earning a commission, the supplier is paying you for actually being the sales role. So at Bridge, we had uh, uh, a workshop with a number of our uh, owners and advisors that uh, have been charging professional uh, uh, types of advisory fees on what they're charging, how they're charging, uh, trying to make people feel comfortable because this really is is stepping out of most advisors' comfort zone. Mm. I think they see the logic of it. I think they're having a hard time bringing themselves to do it. How do you do it? How do you position it to the client uh, to make them feel that they're not being gouged or whatever yeah. the answer is? And so we, we talk through all of those things of, of how you approach it with the client how you sell it, how you uh, how you charge in terms of what kind of numbers. I mean, we actually talk numbers what people were charging. Uh, obviously, every agency has to choose their own fee structure. Mm. But if we can get uh, the majority of the industry, not just travel leaders, but the whole industry to think of ourselves as a professional uh, um, industry versus a transactional industry, right. I think we all will be better off if it allows uh, the agency to become more profitable than they can afford to pay higher uh, wages. Most of our owners have gone to a, uh, a salary and some type of incentive uh, based on the, the fees and, and commissions that the agents collect. So that means the agent just makes more money. 
And one of the things that I think this industry has been um, accused of over decades is paying lower wages. Right. I mean, some of our advisors are making six figures. Uh, and, and it seems like the ones who are on more of a uh, incentive compensation plan tend to make a lot more money than the pure salary. Yeah, no, I know absolutely. That, uh, I know. And, you know, and, and the, the six figure ones also are the ones that have consulting fees. I know. Absolutely. Uh, even if it's a, a placeholder, you know, $500 or $600 to, to me to plan your trip. Uh, uh, but, you know, again, it, it's kind of it owes back to the future on this debate because, you know, we've, we've been talking about this since the 90s when I did stories uh, talked and talking with uh, Dr. Uh, Bob Jocelyn, uh, you know, where he was all advocating fees and, we, and, and everybody, it, it sounded logical. But then here we are, you know, 20 years, 25 years later, and we're still talking about this, but maybe this, this particular crisis, which is probably the worst we've ever seen, uh, will get people over the hump who are not already there. Well, I, I sincerely hope so, because I, I strongly believe that uh, the, the value that we give to our clients is absolutely huge. And I've said this many, many times, I don't care if you're retired or, or working, you have a limited amount of time, and there's so many destinations you want to go to in your life. Most people aren't going to go back to uh, destination X again. Oh, I had a bad trip. We'll just go there again next year. Right. No, that's not the way it works. It's I had a bad trip. I'm not going back there because I have 50 other people or places I want to go. Um, a really great travel advisor will make every vacation experience great. And uh, that's worth so much. And to charge a few hundred dollars, um, as you say, three, four, five hundred dollars is when you think of the experience the in client receives, it's such a value. No, absolutely. And another part of that compensation thing is, of course, uh, we're seeing some movement, and I'm sure you are, and you're working with your suppliers that you know, travel, there really has to be a movement to change travel agency compensation models. Uh, you know, agencies and advisors really aren't getting commission at least for months sometimes uh, after they make a sale. Uh, I, I guess I'll ask you straight out, are you working with suppliers uh, to revise the current compensation model? And is there any hope you'll be successful in doing this? Yeah, uh, we've been, uh, we started conversations with our, our suppliers uh, really early March, uh, maybe in February. John Lovell's taken the role. I've talked to many, many suppliers, Pam Young, who's head of our industry relations, has uh, talked to the suppliers. And I understand the supplier's point of view, but the, but our point of view is that our travel distribution system, not just travel leaders, but everyone, the travel distribution system uh, needs cash flow. Mm -hmm. And today, you mentioned a few months, there's many cases where it could be 12 to 16, 18 months, especially on the, the more expensive, say world cruises, things like that where you actually book it today and it may not go until 2022. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the, the agents can't survive uh, 18 months uh, waiting for their wages. So uh, the agencies uh, in many cases have to uh, upfront uh, the payment to, to the agent. Uh, and we are working very hard with uh, all of our suppliers that, uh, Really, we think the model ought to be uh, when you make a, a deposit payment, a final payment, that's when the majority, if not all the commission ought to be paid. So if, if you're making a, a 15% and someone gives you a $200 deposit, you get 15% of that. When they make the final payment, that's when you, you make your money. Uh, yes, if the customer cancels, uh, the agency owes that money back to the customer. But again, there's where you, the advisor, need to sell insurance, cancellation insurance, to whereby you, the agency, is protected, but also you, the client's protected. So um, we, we, this system has to get to fixed. I mentioned earlier uh, that we're, we're really concerned about the cash flow of the agencies over the next uh, nine months before travel really happens. Hopefully, again, there's another PPP program. But what happens if there isn't? Right. And what happens if 
if uh, sales, we know when the cruise lines relaunch, they're not going to launch with their uh, full fleet. It's going to be on a staggered basis. So sales aren't going to just magically uh, turn on day one. It's going to be a slow ramp up. Yeah. We, you know, the cash flow is, is the concern. It's not that, you know, it's great to have accounts receivables of, of uh, X thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars. That does no good in paying your staff. That doesn't help you pay your rent. That doesn't help you survive uh, to pay for the necessities you need to pay for. Mm -hmm. We need a faster cash flow system. And the only way to do that is to have the suppliers recognize that. Uh, Again, they're sitting on the full amount of money, even though they aren't providing the product for months or years. So there's no reason to say, other than the fact they like the cash flow and they don't want to give the cash flow to the to the agency distribution system. Uh, it, I can't imagine another type of system whereby the salesman is not compensated earlier, whether they're an employee or, or, or other thing. When they make the sale, that's when they get paid. Well, so, let's, yeah. but let's hope that this, this can happen. I know there are a lot of, a lot of different agency groups that are looking at this uh, challenge and with suppliers, and some re- suppliers actually have been receptive. Yes, some have. And I, I would say this is, uh, no, this is a universal thing. Uh, actually, uh, I brought it up to the ASTA uh, Consortium Committee uh, when this first started. We had a call in February, and all the other consortium heads uh, uh, immediately bought in. We actually did some joint communications to suppliers uh, back uh, in the first quarter. Uh, so this is something we're all united on. Uh, it, it's something that has to happen for the survival of the, of the distribution system. Just no doubt about it. Absolutely. Well, hopefully that's going to happen. But uh, out, of, out of crisis, we get these innovations that probably should have been looked at uh, years ago. Right. Uh, uh, because, uh, you know, it, that, that always existed, as did the whole issue with uh, uh, feeds, you know, and again, we're looking at that. Uh, is there anything else that uh, was announced during uh, Bridge to the Future? You had, you had caught me that the book with confidence policy. I'd forgotten about that one, but uh, that, that's a very key one. Uh, you know, and, uh, uh, and, and sometimes we minimize this, but our supplier presentations uh, actually were outstanding. Mm-hmm. I, I sometimes, you know, as much as I just complain about suppliers and, and their uh, commission compensation uh, models, The truth is they are doing an outstanding job of education of what's going on during COVID. They're being very proactive. The the physical resorts, uh, airlines, cruise lines are making huge investments to ensure the safety of all of our clients and to hear their presentations and talk about what they're doing. Uh, and how they're very becoming very proactive in in, in uh, uh, modifying their method of operation, uh, how they uh, uh, the cleanliness. I, uh, Delta Airlines was one of our sponsors, and uh, obviously they are uh, just uh, changing everything. Uh, I actually flew on Delta about three weeks ago, right. and I felt totally safe. I, I haven't flown on the others, so I can't speak to them, but. Uh, uh, just with the social distancing, uh, with the uh, plexiglass uh, uh, dividers between uh, the staff and, and the, the uh, customer, the requirement of masks, uh, the handling or the handing out uh, uh, wipes. I mean, just uh, you felt like you were being protected. No, absolutely. And I, I can vouch for the other area, airlines. I've traveled on a few and uh, I, I tell people, if you're worried about going on an airplane, uh, you shouldn't. Uh, you, you, you should no. be more worried about going into the grocery store or uh, some other place in your own apartment or house uh, because it's flying is the least of your problems. They really are, are doing a great job uh, of getting passengers to and from. And yes, you know, some still like Delta have the middle seats blocked off. And uh, but even there, you know, even there, unfortunately for the airlines, there hasn't been a lot of capacity coming through. So most flights, I mean, boy, it's it's actually a pleasure 
<laughs> because you don't really have anybody else or very many people on the flight. You got a choice of seats and uh, you can go. So anybody who gives me that line, you know, I don't want to get on an airplane. I'm like, no, no, it's, it's uh, you know, you, you might be better off traveling on vacation than staying at home, to be honest with you. Well, the amount of, uh, of uh, you know, when I was looking at the air systems, the uh, all the airlines have introduced and how often it changes the air in the entire cabin. Uh, every two minutes, by the way. Right. Uh, it, it's incredible when you think of what they've done. And uh, just to hear the, uh, from the suppliers, I think they need to, a shout out for everything they are doing. No, uh, absolutely. But, and you gave them a great showcase with uh, Bridge to the Future. Yes. Anything else you want to get out to your members or to travel advisors in general about uh, uh, Travel Leaders Network or, or this most recent conference? Well, you know, the one thing I would say is uh, uh, sales are improving. We're seeing a steady improvement in Sun and Fun. We, our cruise bookings are picking up. Uh, uh, Europe actually is is uh, being booked. Everywhere is being booked. Now we just need to open it. I would say to all advisors, as I said to the members of Travel Leaders Network, uh, we all got to hang in there. We got to work together. We have to support each other, but this industry will come back. Americans, Canadians love to vacation travel, no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. And they will find a way to do it. And our suppliers uh, are working diligently to do it in a safe manner. So hang in there. Don't lose faith in this business. It will be stronger than ever. Well, Roger, those are great words to close on. Uh, great, great to see you. You got to stop hanging out in airports, though, because, you know, that's your backdrop, by the way. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I know. Even, even it's on the list, James. <laughs> that used to be my second home. Yeah, I know. Well, even though we just decided that airports and air, air, uh, uh, flights are the safest thing you can be on. So there you, there you go. You're in a safe place. So <laughs> anyway, I do hope we get to see each other soon live. Uh, uh, we, we missed you, you know, obviously all these conferences that we usually see uh, each other. And uh, uh, hopefully we'll be back to that by 2021. Uh, but in the meantime, it's great to see you here uh, virtually and, and spend some time with you. Thanks so much, James. Take care of yourself. I'm James Schillinglaw, and this is Insider Travel Report.